Rome would be great. Yeah, yeah, okay. 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 Sure. You are. You could just read the first three sentences and not go into the, the detailed stuff. But Rowan will be here, I'm sure. And is it four or four ten? Who's this old? Okay. Remember, embellish and tell lies. <laughs> John Butler, so thanks Hi. for coming. Really yeah. appreciate it. So. Oh, good. I'm looking forward to it. So thanks for the invitation. I'm sure everybody will come. I know. Well, I figured I'd either insert it or um, give it a rush. So I won't finish it. In fact, I won't have any more. It was true. Thank you. Thanks to IEE for the invitation. It's wonderful to be back in Santa Barbara. Before I begin, can I get a rough idea how many of you are doing research in or teaching in or interested in environmental sciences? Okay. How about economics? Not too many. Engineering, broadly speaking. Ah, so mostly engineers. 
public policy, sociology, anything like that? Okay. All right. So engineering crowd, I'll tailor that. My talk a little bit to that. So transportation energy, what is best? The world is changing in the transportation area and the energy world, new technologies, <coughs> new cohorts with different types of demands, new environmental problems. How do we decide what to do? What is the best thing to do? What's the best energy source? That's the question that I want to answer today. So naturally, I hope, the first thing you're going to say is, what the heck does he mean by best? So I will spend a minute to tell you what I mean by best. Then I will jump into explaining what the problems are that we're trying to fix. What motivates this question in the first place? Why do we care about what transportation energy sources we have. So I'll talk a little bit then about external costs in the United States. I'll explain what that means to you people who aren't economists. And then go a little bit more broadly and look at global trends and a bunch of other important indicators that aren't covered in external cost estimates, air pollution, water use, nutrient discharge, biodiversity. After setting the stage with what the problems are that motivate this question, I'll give a qualitative overview of potential solutions to transportation problems. This will identify where we need to have quantitative analysis to help us answer what the best option is. So then I'll provide some quantitative analysis of water consumption, land use as it says, greenhouse gas emissions which are relevant to climate change evaluation. And then finally, one of many possible grand syntheses, a social cost evaluation where you actually put dollar values on as many of these environmental impacts as you can and add them up along with the regular private or consumer costs come up with what's called the social cost. This will be done mainly for LDVs, which stands for light duty vehicles. I will then make some incredibly brief and very unsatisfying comments on other modes besides light duty vehicles. And if I have time, which I probably won't if experience is any guide, I will jump into the context for considering implementing these solutions where I look at some <coughs> energy context variables and more interestingly, I think, the radically changing social context, demand side drivers, if you will, that influence what we think about transportation solutions, how they could be implemented, what's realistic, what's viable. I don't know what the standard protocol is, whether you prefer, whether the IEE people prefer to have questions afterwards or during. I can see advantages to both. I tend to be in favor of questions during. That means I probably won't get through, but if that's okay with organizers, let's do it that way. So interrupt, throw tomatoes or cookies in the back if you have, and then follow up with a question. So we'll do questions as we go, and I'll get as far as I can. Are you ready? Here we go. So transportation energy, what is best? What do I mean? So we have some words up there. The rest of the talk is pretty much numbers and charts. But this is an important question. So qualitatively, that's what I mean. Something to do with long-term human welfare, broadly conceived, with, and this is really important, especially in the current world we're living in, with an emphasis on the well-being of people that are the least well-off, this isn't a plan to help the rich. <laughs> and with emphasis on the sustainability of all Earth's ecosystems. As you see as I get into this, we're not just concerned about climate change, that's a big one, but with a lot of other metrics as well. So accordingly, that means there's going to be a wide range of evaluation criteria. The criteria that I'm going to use to answer this question, what is best, will include climate change, air quality impacts, water quality impacts, land use biodiversity impacts at a minimum. There are others, of course. That's not a complete list, but this is a broad enough list. Even though I'm doing a social cost-benefit analysis, at least part of a social cost-benefit analysis, this is not necessarily the same for the couple of people that are economists here as what's traditionally done in benefit-cost analysis. And there are a couple of important differences here, and this will resonate for those of you that are familiar with debates about how to invest in climate change mitigation solutions. For example, first of all, I'm taking a long-term view in my evaluations, my quantitative evaluations, with a very low or near-zero discount rate. I'll explain that more later. 
More importantly, and more subtly and technically from an economic perspective, when I'm doing the evaluation side of things, evaluating impacts, and evaluating impacts on different types of people, I don't trade off, as it says there, rich person amenity values with impacts on human health or welfare. In even more technical terms, I'm assuming that there are perfect zero cost substitutes for many of the so-called amenity values of transportation and that therefore they can't be traded off against impacts on health and welfare. This distinguishes it from traditional cost-benefit analysis and it has dramatic effects on their results. These combinations of valuation and discount rates has dramatic effects on the results. That's why I'm spending time on it because I come to some conclusions that are quite a bit different than most people come to. So what this is not is a talk which is you typically see on, for example, the cost effectiveness of just reducing CO2 emissions per se, just actual carbon dioxide emissions, from the use of fossil fuels. So I hope you get a sense of how this is much broader and a much, much broader in terms of the evaluation criteria and broader in terms of this analytical framework. Okay, I'm going to start talking now about measures of the problems that are motivating this search for new transportation energy sources. Here is one measure. This is just one. This is the external cost of motor vehicle use. This is analysis I did a while ago, and it's dated even further back than that, but it's still relevant, of the external cost of motor vehicle use. What this means is we've taken a bunch of impacts that don't normally occur in monetary terms and used a variety of methods to estimate the equivalent dollar value of those impacts. So these are the damage categories down there, as you can see, and then there's low and high estimates of the annual dollar value equivalent of those different damages. So it means that in the motor vehicle sector and the tire sector, heavy and light duty in this case, there were 30 to 120 billion dollars per year of uncompensated, that's not exactly what it means, but that's close enough, accident damages and travel delay imposed by congestion, 30 to 140 billion. Now we get to the ones that are interesting from an energy perspective, most directly affected by the type of energy, type of vehicle technology we use, and the ones that I will be addressing more closely later on. Air pollution, climate change, noise, water pollution, and energy security impacts. So we see very large potential impacts, but also a very wide range due to uncertainty and all the steps of the valuation method. For air pollution damages, helmet health impacts can range from 20 to a couple hundred billion dollars per year. This is per year. Current impacts might be a little bit less than that, as I'll explain momentarily. Let's jump down to climate change. This is interesting. Climate change damages here shown are fairly small. Again, from the entire US vehicle fleet, and also this includes, by the way, all greenhouse gases, not just carbon dioxide. It even includes urban air pollutants in there, CO2 equivalent climate effects. I'm showing two different numbers there. First is the damages for the US only, the from before the slash, and the second is global damages. So in both cases, I'm estimating the cost of emissions from the US motor vehicle fleet, but in this case, it's the impact on the US of those emissions, and in that case, it's the impact on the world of those emissions. Still relatively small numbers, why? Because as you see in the fine print down there, and I will revisit this later, because this is a very important parameter, and one in which the Trump administration does want any more research on, by the way, the so-called social cost of carbon. And it's true, they don't want any more research on the social cost of carbon. One to ten dollars per metric ton of CO2. It's a lowish number now, but not too much less than the official US government estimate. <clears throat> most of the game here, most of the results are driven by this number. So we have to be explicit about it and justify our choices, and I'll do that later. For the rest of the costs, there's a couple of things that are interesting. Uh, noise and water pollution costs that we're able to estimate are relatively small, 
but there are a lot of other water quality and water use impacts that are not evaluated here and that typically are not evaluated in these external cost analyses, but that are very important from the standpoint of trying to determine what the best energy source for transportation is. And I will address those unquantified external costs of water use and water quality later. Yes? Correct, you are. Follow-up question? <laughs> Why? <laughs> That's because at the time, the analyses that were available to apportion global climate change damages to the U.S. came up with a number that was essentially near zero because of supposed compensating benefits and <clears throat> adaptability. So. Most, that was at the time, that is no longer true, but it was a reasonable estimate back then given what everybody assumed. The big numbers in climate change, typically actually the big numbers in air pollution damages, the big numbers in accidents, all the big numbers except for travel delay are driven by people dying, technically marginal changes in the risk of people dying and the associated willingness to pay for changes in marginal risk. And in the US back at the time, number of people dying from climate change damages was assumed to be relatively small. It still is small compared to disease and heat-induced deaths in countries that are less well developed, but that's why the number is zero for that analysis. But it's a great question because that's going to change dramatically in the results that I present later. So I need to explain what's happening, the difference between now and then. Yes. Pardon me? Uh, because this is a very, that was the most current analysis year when I did the study 27 years ago, no, 17 years ago. So it's very hard to get complete data on all the relevant variables. So these, these were published around 1999, 2000, 2001. And by the time we got it published, that was the most current data set. Yes, bring one. This is technically the due to the motor vehicle share of oil use and its contribution to <coughs> the volatility in the price of oil. So what this means, this is for economic detail, but energy security costs have several components. One is what's called a pecuniary cost, which is just we lose wealth because oil is priced higher than it would be in a free market or well, technically well above its supply costs. So money goes to Saudi Arabia to build big hotels that shaped like elephants or whatever they're shaped like. And that's what this is. There's military expenditures, strategic petroleum reserves. This has to do with the fact that because of scarcity and the oligopolistic control of oil in the market, the price can change more rapidly than certain input factors like labor and capital have chance to adjust to their new optimal levels associated with the new price regime. And so there's a potential loss of output due to the distance between their ideal point and their actual point because the price is changing more rapidly. And that's what this means, <coughs> excuse me. And the portion of that that's due to the oil share of the total oil demand and hence putatively oil's total price volatility is that cost. Wow, I'm really not going to get. <laughs> okay, we're going to limit to one, two questions per slide, or I won't get very far. Actually, then I'm going to skip that, interest of time. Uh, so now let's look at some historical trends to get an idea of where those external costs that I estimated have been heading since 1990 and where they're likely to head in the future. Actually, I'll leave this up for one for an important point. So when we do these external cost analyses, and this is important for understanding how different energy options
can impact the total cost because the total cost can be calculated really as total amount of travel, the impacts per mile of travel, like how much you emit per mile of travel, the translation of those emissions into actual exposure, how many people breathe certain amounts of air quality, what happens to them for every microgram per meter cube of particulate matter they inhale, what's the increase in their risk of premature mortality, and then for that change in the risk of premature mortality, what's the so-called willingness to pay value for that. So what we can see is that uniformly VMT has been going up. And this is an important point because we're working against constantly expanding VMT. There's a caveat to that, which I definitely won't get to now. I can see it towards the end. VMT recently hasn't been going up as much. So that's driving up total damages. People are getting wealthier, so their loss of productivity and maybe their loss of life or their incapacitation gets more valuable. All economic damages go up. There's more people as well. This is always happening. So exposure goes up. So really, the only handle that we have in many of these cases to reduce the overall impact are the per mile effects. So we need to have energy sources that reduce these per mile effects, whether it's energy use per mile or emissions of greenhouse gases per mile, to as low a level as possible. And then we've had one major success, I would say, legitimately in the transportation area over the past few decades in mitigating the environmental impacts external costs that I've shown, and that's with regard to the per mile emission rate of gasoline and diesel vehicles in the U.S., fairly dramatic changes in emission rates over time. This trend is likely to continue, but it is going to start to flatten out. There are certain limits on the, what the technology can do. There are certain failures. So we've had this success, and as a result of the results in the decline, in per mile emissions from vehicles, we've seen fairly dramatic declines in total emissions. The declines in total emissions haven't been as dramatic as the decline in per mile emissions. Why? Because we've had more miles traveled. So that tends to reduce it. On the other hand, let's look at emissions of CO2 equivalent greenhouse gases from transport. Here I have a range of different modes. Over time, from 1990, this so happens to be the year that I did the analysis, up to as close to the present as we have data for. This is the CO2 equivalent of CO2 itself, methane, N2O, maybe CFCs, I don't remember, shown for these modes in their actual estimated physical units. And what do you see? Well, what you kind of know, which is that <coughs> there haven't been dramatic enough increases in fuel economy or reductions in energy use per mile to compensate for the fairly steadily increase in total miles, nor have we substituted low carbon or low greenhouse gas fuels over this period of time. So what does that mean? Our multiplication is going to show that in most cases we have some kind of increase. So this remains qualitatively still quite a big problem. Is there a question? Correct. Good question. Tailpipe only. Yes, this is not life cycle. This is just based on the actual fuel that's burned in the car or truck or plane. A uh, couple quick slides on water quality issues. Interesting information that might not be familiar to some of you. This shows, as it says there, cumulative, cumulative confirmed leases that are not cleaned up, cumulative over the time, and the cumulative total amount of leases. So in spite of tightening restrictions on underground storage tanks, we still have non-trivial amounts of cumulative leaks from underground storage tanks. So water quality, just the water quality issues that we have looked at, and I'm going to look at a much wider range later on, are still important. 
destroy and spills impacting navigable U.S. waterways. And by the way, that analysis that I showed earlier did have an estimate of the damage costs of oil spills, average annual oil spills as of 1990. And this shows that, as we know, there continue to be a problem here. This shows sort of a background rate of a million-ish, just a unit here, gallons per year. And but once in a while, we have, you know, it's over here, something like the deep water horizon. And these occur periodically. There was the Exxon Valdez somewhere, I don't know what that was, 1989 or something like that, right? So <laughs> this is a problem that's not going away. It won't go away. And one that is somewhat suited. Uh, noise, let's skip noise. So we spend a lot of money on noise barriers, and it's still an ongoing problem. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that everything that I showed you on the 1990 slides, probably qualitatively roughly right, with a couple exceptions, air pollution damages might be down a little bit, maybe a modest amount. And climate change damages, well, that depends, as I said, on the social cost of carbon. We will get to that. That was the U.S. That was quantifiable external costs. Remember, I'm talking about reasons that we care about transportation energy, what its impacts are. Let's look more broadly. Let's look globally. And let's look at a wider range of indicators. In fact, let's focus on several that weren't even quantified, as I said, haven't been quantified in these kinds of analyses. So I'm going to look at air pollution, but water use, nutrient discharge, and biodiversity to give you a sense of what the problems are, the problems that potentially can be affected by the transportation energy choices we make in the future. So globally, again, this is worth emphasizing because this is our success story. What was true in the US is true in other countries and Japan. So I'm showing here, are, these are European standards, those are Japanese standards. These are standards, but actual emissions pretty much track the standards. There's differences. For those of you who read analyses, you know what they are. But these show dramatic reductions, and they actually continue past this year here. That actually looks like Euro 4, I think, to 5, not Euro 6. As a result of, again, declining emission standards, we see outside the US, other countries, it's a similar shape, right? We see reductions, not as dramatic, but reductions in the actual emissions of these key pollutants, PM 2.5, that's particulate matter, fine particulate matter, NOx, nitrogen oxides. Uh, in the UK and Italy, just as an example, you can get these data for all sorts of countries. <coughs> they go up here because not new emission standards aren't in effect until about here, and then new emission standards bring them down. So again, we have a good story, but wait. We have a good story for the transportation sector in developed countries that have these tight emission standards. That's not the whole story. Now let's look at the entire energy use sector. And let's go beyond. This is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It's had Australia, Japan, Europe, the US, Canada, and some others. Some others forgotten. This is Brazil, Russia, India, Indonesia, China, and South Africa. Remember I said I want to focus on people in less well-off places, less developed countries. So there's a lot of people there, and impacts on people in these countries are especially severe. If you impact the infrastructure or the health and education and welfare of people that are just starting up the development curve, that has a bigger impact, broadly speaking, on human welfare, which is what we should be caring about, than you know, if you reduce the options for a rich guy in the US, for example. So with that in mind, and this is rest of world. This is from a great document the OECD did. They did projections, I'll be showing a lot more from this, of a bunch of environmental indicators in these regions for 2030 and 2050. So what do we see? Well, we see projected reductions in OECD countries because emission standards are tightening more than population and demand is growing. But what happens over here? We see projected increases in some of the key pollutants these are especially damaging pollutants. So all of a sudden, <laughs> stepping back, looking <coughs> more broadly, looking into the future, even the air pollution problem is a big problem, especially in developing world. 
And now we can translate that. This is part of the steps that we take to get to that external cost estimate. You have emissions and then exposure. People die, ah, and then you put a value on that. Here's an estimate, again from OECD, of global premature deaths from various environmental risks. And particulate matter, this is outdoor, indoor air pollution, which is a surprisingly big number, right? It's counted separately. And ground level ozone, which is entirely, these are both key, pretty much to energy use entirely. We're talking some big numbers here projected to increase dramatically. This is not a trivial amount of people kicking the bucket prematurely. 3.5 million people, and this is in that year, not cumulative. So just to see if that number made sense, we did our own analysis. This is our analysis uh, published in a forthcoming paper, which comes up, and it, we didn't plan it that way. It's exactly the same middle case number. Uh, this shows, we broke it out by country to show you where those premature deaths due to fossil fuel air pollution, all fossil fuel air pollution, due to mortality from particulate nozo matter occurring. For 139 countries that we did individual estimates for, we have 3.5 million, it's a lot of people. And you can already sort of get a sense, right, that when you multiply these 3.5 million people by any reasonable value of what we call statistical life, millions of dollars, you're gonna get a big number. That's a big potential benefit that you get if you eliminate that. And there are transportation energy solutions that can eliminate that and get those benefits. And again, where are these occurring? India and China have half of the emissions-related deaths of the top 10, and some large fraction of the total, 1.54 million, just in those two countries alone. So that's the airport. Yes? Uh, sulfate aerosols, mostly. Not well, actually there's a lot of high sulfur diesel fuel still being used, projected to be used in parts of the world, so I take that. I don't know the breakdown actually. It probably is mostly coal, typically, but there is a non-trivial amount of high sulfur diesel assumed to be used. This is of course driven by assumptions. We don't have a magic crystal ball. It's perfectly possible in principle, because it's done already today technically, to have low sulfur diesel in Brazil, Russia, India, into China, and South Africa, but it just seems unlikely. So, Wait, so you're talking about this? Well, because the, the yeah, but the well, the rest of the world population is. I mean, the BRICS countries have probably more population than the rest of the world does by a lot, probably. So, that would be what's going on. I would hope. I think. Yes, I want. Good question. So, in the external cost analysis that I did from 1990, I evaluated those, and in other tables in this work here, we've also evaluated those. Uh, they're not shown here. Uh, since I used scaling factors from my 1990 work, you could probably use the same scaling factors to get a rough idea. So that, oh, I didn't break it out by mortality here. It's another one's mortality. So I can't show you, but I think I recall that they're about five to 30 percent, the non-mortality, morbidity-related impacts. The biggest one would be something like chronic morbidity from PM 2.5 emissions. So it's, uh, it's in that ballpark, let's say. There's a good deal of uncertainty, so now we sprint forward. Okay, on to water. Oops, too fast. There we go. Let's turn our attention to water now, and let's turn our attention to not oil spills, which we evaluated, or leaking underground storage tanks, but the bigger and more important and pressing question, 
which is also strongly affected by the type of transportation energy, water availability, and general water pollution indices. Here's an interesting slide. I'll show a couple different estimates here. From This guy does a lot of estimates of water stress indices and water availability. And did you have a question? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Showing the proportion of total groundwater use that is non-renewable. So this is a measure of just how much you're depleting your groundwater and eventually you could pension to run out. So it projected this time to 2099. And so in all cases, uh, especially in China and USA and other Pakistan, we're seeing some large potential depletions of groundwater. Keep in mind again that this means that any transportation energy option going forward in the future that puts additional stress on water supplies is going to exacerbate what's already a bad problem. So let's dig into that a little more. This just shows over a very short period of time the trends underlying that last slide that had the projections. This is renewable, again, renewable internal freshwater resources, cubic meters per capita, just over this relatively short period of time. And we're seeing a decline in the available resources per capita. At the same time that we're seeing this decline per capita, we're seeing, and we have seen, and are projected to see, significant increases in water demand for different uses. Same OECD study. Same breakdown by geography, 2000 and 2050. Look at BRICS again. Large increases in projected water demand. Where are these coming from? Well, interestingly, a lot of them are coming from the electricity sector and from the manufacturing sector. So that's the energy sector. The transportation system uses energy. and. <coughs> If we can get the transportation sector to help contribute to this reduction here, that's in the right direction as well. So overall in the world, large increases in just the electricity sector alone. So we have declining water availability in, yeah? Yes, yeah, so this is that's a, so there are lots of different ways of measuring the quality, the type of water that's used, where it's from, and actually what use means. And I don't know what demand means here. Correct. Well, so what that's right. There's really the issue here is whether the water, I would look at it this way, can perform the same set of uses in more or less the same place that it did before. And so let's look at it that way. It's water whose usability has been transformed in some way, either because it's been polluted, it's been displaced, or it's been thermally enhanced inappropriately. So that's how to look at that. But good point. So put those together, declining availability, increasing demand, and what do you get? This is a really eye-opening projection for me. Same geographic areas again, same source. What we're showing here are people living in water stress basins in the year 2050, projected with 2,000 as a baseline. And let's look at severe water stress, which is this hard to see top one there. <coughs> And in case you're going to ask, I don't know technically, uh, I, I don't remember what the definition of severe is, but it's not good. Nobody wants to be in a severely water stress basin. It probably means that there's inability to meet basic needs all the time at any time. I'm going to guess it's something like that. So large increases. The RE, this is a baseline scenario. That's a renewable energy scenario in the people living in severely water stress basins in bricks, these are, this is a billion people there. Those are 1,000 millions. This scales a billion people. So what's that? That's a lot of billions, of, that's a lot of people projected to live in severely water stress basins. That's two and a half more, it's almost three billion people in 
countries where then the last thing they need on top of everything else is water stress. <laughs> and in the world, we have one, two, three, almost four billion people in the baseline case. Four billion people projected. There are lots of other people who do analyses like this. And I don't know of anybody who says, that's just total baloney. So water availability, water use, water stress needs to rise up higher on our radar, in our evaluation framework. Now let's look at a related issue quickly. I'm going to go to discharges into rivers. Because I'm trying to set up a situation where we're going to evaluate one of the major alternative energy sources, bioenergy. Who here is a big fan of bioenergy? Uh, I guess I sort of set it up as <laughs> you wouldn't want to raise your hand. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, where uh, there's a lot of things mitigating against the answer to the what is best question being bioenergy. So we see projections of increasing agricultural area. Not dramatic, but some increase in agricultural area. We see projections of increasing intensity of fertilizer use. Not dramatic, but this is, this is the last one was hectares. This is kilograms per hectare. But some increase projected. This seems reasonable to me. Put those two together, and what are you going to get? Since there's really no way to control that runoff, with a little more agricultural land and a little more intensive use of fertilizer on that land, you're going to get increasing discharges of nutrients, phosphorus, nitrogen, into the major ocean basins. And that's what this shows here. The last one's 2050. It says million tons. This one just shows nitrogen. You need something similar, I think, for phosphates. So we have a related water quality problem. It's not getting better. Next one, biodiversity, species abundance. This matters, of course, because this is related to how we use our land. And how we use our land is relevant to the question of what? Transportation energy is best. What is this? The mean species abundance. What is shown here is 100% is the amount of species that there would be in these areas, the amount of species that there would be if humans didn't go around and muck things up. So view it as sort of Eden species level, as in Garden of Eden species level. Got it? So that's what 100% is. And this last one here, which is called the remaining mean species abundance, is where we are either at or projected to be at. And the difference is the loss of species compared to the pristine case due to these reasons. So you see a lot of pressures, and they're all getting bigger, such that by the time we get to 2050, we're seeing a 7% absolute reduction in the number of species, maybe 10% in relative terms. Now, I don't know if you think that's big or small, but look at it this way. How many species do you think there are in the world? I don't know if they're counting everything like every beetle or insect. I hope they are. There's a lot of species. I don't know what the number is. It's going to be hundreds of millions at least. Is that right? Anybody know? I think it. Maybe J.B. Haldane knows, but anyway, so it's, he's the beetle guy. So, but let's just say it's around that order of magnitude. So you know, seven percent, not a small number. It could be tens, a few tens of millions of species lost. So, as an indicator of another problem related to land use. And one thing that's driving this that we can look at is total forest area. Projections of total forest area. Let's look at primary forest area. This is probably a good indicator of habitat loss that's associated with the decline in species that you saw. Primary forest is this blue line right there. So the projection is for primary forest to decline in the BRICS countries from, this is normalized to the year 2010, to a loss of 12 percentage points. Pretty big loss. What does that mean? Anything that we talk about that exacerbates those kind of pressures on land use, pressures on forests, is going to have compounding effects on biodiversity. Skip that one. So. 
Where are we at right now in our review of the problems? We're there. It's pretty much right. That's where we are. There's a lot of problems out there, all potentially impacted by transportation energy choices. OK, deep breath. Now let's start getting a handle on what different options might do with respect to these problems that are so bad and getting worse. Let's just do it qualitatively first. One slide, and then we will identify, I will identify, the areas where quantitative analysis is needed, and then get through a few of those. Okay. So here is a qualitative evaluation of potential transport solutions, evaluation with respect to all of these criteria, including now I've thrown in costs because, yeah, we do care about costs. You can't just mitigate all of these and not care about cost. But we don't only care about cost. It's one factor. So this is qualitative. Up here are two that are only marginally affected by energy use. These are very interesting problems. They're relevant problems. And a lot of interesting research on things like automation, for example, which you've heard about, connected and autonomous vehicles, can have pretty big impacts on these. But that's not really an energy question. That doesn't mean it's not interesting. I have just arbitrarily or for convenience constrained my talk to be about energy. So putting those aside with just a few comments up there, let's focus on these. So for air pollution, I don't think we need a quantitative analysis because unless you get to zero, you're always going to be fighting two things growth in demand, increase in vehicle miles of travel, and the inevitable failure of emission control systems. You're going to have people that don't maintain their cars. You're just going to have random technological failure. And so overall, if you want to get this problem solved, and we can, I just say go to zero. Nonetheless, I did do a sort of a cost-benefit analysis you might get to later. But that's my qualitative solution, zero. Climate change, actually, it looks like it should be zero, too. With what we know now about the need to get to, heck, not just 2 degrees centigrade is the limit. How about 1.5? How about as little as we can limit it? <laughs> when it comes to matters of tinkering with global systems, I think prudence requires forbearance. So the less, the best. We do have zero system, zero fossil fuel system. So, now we come to, for those of you that know about this field, that work in it, what really, in a way, this talk is about, for the few experts, is really a comparison of electrification with bioenergy. That's kind of the core choice. So we know that electrification with zero emission primary energy, and of course it has to be zero emission primary energy, and I will evaluate that for you, is good because it's zero emission. But what about bioenergy? Now, that's a topic for several talks in and of itself, some of which I give. And I hope to just touch on some key issues here. But we need to investigate this a little bit more quantitatively. And I will do that a bit. Oil use, again, let's just go to zero. We can go to zero. So this electrification or biofuel will satisfy that. We know that that's how it happens. It's technically feasible, so we don't need any more on that. For noise. The energy system, electric drive systems are quieter. This matters at low speeds. At high speeds, tire noise tends to dominate the total noise profile from travel. But at low speeds, where most of us spend our time, and in cities where the speeds are very low, the, <clears throat> there's a non-trivial noise reduction benefit, which we've quantified from electric drive systems. We've quantified it taking out the tire-related component. OK. Water use, just like with climate change, we're going to need a formal evaluation here. That is, it's not prima facie obvious <laughs> which energy options, electrification or bioenergy, are better, or at least not how much one is better than the other. So we'll touch briefly on that formally. This one, I think I can make a qualitative statement, which is you would need a formal evaluation, but really bioenergy is the worst choice for any system that uses any kind of land. It pretty much has to be that way. Because the alternative 
is always to do something a little bit better with the land. And then obviously we need a formal evaluation of cost. So what is it we need? We need climate change, water use, and cost quantitatively evaluated to get a better handle on what transportation energy is best. So let's go. Water consumption. There have been a lot of analyses of this and actually some standard life cycle models now are starting to incorporate water use. But this is roughly the right picture. This one's a little bit old from some people who do this sort of work. What am I showing here? Okay, the actual end use fuel shown across the top, fuel. This is Fisher Tropes diesel, hydrogen, electricity, 85% ethanol, biodiesel, and 85% ethanol. And this is the feedstock that's used to make that fuel, oil, natural gas, wind, water, solar power, the US electricity grid, grid irrigated corn stover, irrigated soybeans to make biodiesel, and non irrigated corn stover, that's a proxy. You can view that as more or less the same as, say, ethanol made from woody biomass. This is a type of vehicle. All of these things matter, of course. This is a type of vehicle that uses the fuel made from that feedstock. ICEV's internal combustion engine vehicle, that's your regular car that goes This is a fuel cell vehicle running on hydrogen, battery electric vehicle, got it? So for those combinations of technologies, fuels, and feedstocks, here is the amount of water, gallons of water, consumed per mile of travel for the whole life cycle, as estimated by King and Weber. Here's our baseline current situation around numbers, tenth of a gallon per mile. In comparison to that, irrigated biofuels, obviously, I guess, <laughs> use orders of magnitude more Non-irrigated biofuels, eh, about the same order of magnitude, maybe. But, aha, electric drive vehicles using only wind, water, and solar power use almost nothing. Why? Because water use analyses for wind and solar power production show very low levels of water consumption by any metric. So that's an important point, because I think I spent enough time on the importance of understanding water use, water stress, water pollution. So having your primary energy system be WWS gets you about the best water use benefit, the most minimal water use impact you can get. Now as a rough proxy for impacts on land use, land availability, biodiversity, let's just do a quick comparison of the amount of area required to power the U.S. vehicle fleet, and this is just to show you right, relative magnitudes. That's with cellulosic E85. That's like the corn stover, but this is actually done probably for switchgrass or rapidly grown poplar, something like that. So there's a wide range depending on a variety of assumptions, but that would be the area required. That's corn ethanol, which is where we currently get essentially all of our ethanol from. That amount of land. Remember, this is, of course, proxy for things like biodiversity and habitat loss and species. Aha, but now we've got, and again, just for comparison, it's not saying you could power the entire on-road vehicle fleet with wind, battery, electric vehicles, but you get that amount. The red dot is the turbine footprint and the green area is the spacing around the turbines is, can be used for other things. Oh, question. The blue, the blue circle is cellulosic, so it'd be switchgrass or poplar probably, the two typical. Of course, you can put the wind offshore, not all of it, I'm just pointing that out. <laughs> that was geothermal, which is a tiny footprint that's solar. And yes, we have to put nuclear up there. I don't want to have the nuclear versus solar and wind debate here, but I can have it with somebody else afterwards. <laughs> that's the footprint. That's the buffer area around the plant. So, wow, those are big differences. Those, but we know that. We know that from the, a variety of metrics. You can look at the efficiency of photosynthesis versus the efficiency of solar panels, and it all comes up to the same story. We're talking about orders of magnitude more land requirements and therefore orders of magnitude more impacts on things that are affected by land use and land use occupation fragmentation. 
Okay, let's do climate change now. Whew. This one's going to be good. I'm going to do a life cycle. I don't have a lot of time to explain all the relevant terms here, so you're just going to have to go with it. I'm going to look at all of the systemic emissions of all of the greenhouse gases, including things that are considered to be urban air pollutants but also have climate effects, including some indirect effects for energy systems for ethanol production, ethanol production from cellulose, hydrogen. Do I have hydrogen in there? Boy, my eyes. Well, uh, I think I do. And I don't have battery electric in there because it's going to be zero because I'm using wind, water, and solar power as a baseline. So let's see what we get. What is the point here? The point is to answer this question. Bioenergy is touted as a solution to the transportation sector's contribution to climate change. Why is it touted as a solution? Because on the theory that the CO2 is just recycled. That's the theory that <clears throat> Plants absorb CO2. You burn, after you convert it to a fuel, you burn it, it comes out as CO2, and it just goes like that. So CO2 is neutral. Well, there's a lot of problems with that at different levels. So let's look at the entire system, all of the emissions, and evaluate biofuels. Yes, this is all just biofuels, right? So the wind, water, and solar power competitor is zero because there's zero emissions from the system if the entire system is run off of renewable electricity. That's true. There are zero emissions. That doesn't mean there are actually zero climate effects. There are geophysical effects and things like albedo, but I won't go into those now. So what do we have here? Again, I'm evaluating roughly the impact on climate of several different biofuel options. Up at the top, again, is the type of fuel that you make. This, the specification, the technical, and then the feedstock. So it's ethanol made from corn, ethanol made from switchgrass, methanol made from wood, natural gas from wood, and then Fisher Trof gasoline made from grass. And what I am showing here are the changes versus a gasoline baseline, which isn't shown here because it's just the baseline, just look at the percentage change. So it's a regular reformulated gasoline baseline. Just view it as the life cycle of the gasoline vehicles you drive now, okay? So that's the comparison. And remember, the default assumption, and it is a default assumption of auto analyses, is that the reduction compared to gasoline should be 100%. So it should be minus 100%. That's what the default assumption is of people who do analyses that just take for granted that bioenergy just recycles CO2, we're done with the climate change problem. So let's compare what a detailed model estimates as the actual reduction compared to gasoline with that minus 100%. So here's what we got. So for ethanol, these are all the different sources of the emissions. But here's the line. Here's the take home line right here. Let's just look at the fuel cycle here. Forget this is also making the vehicle. Too much information here. Just focus on this one right there. Fuel cycle emissions change compared to gasoline with all these options. What do you notice? Minus 7.5%. Well, that's made from corn. We know that corn's pretty energy intensive. That doesn't count. What about these are the options that are touted, so-called second generation biofuels, wood, switchgrass. What do you see here? So these two predominantly touted, only 50%, not even 50% reductions. Where's the 100%? What happened? This is a big deal. It's going to be a big deal, too, when I multiply greenhouse gas emissions by a really big social cost of carbon number to come up with the benefits. <laughs> well, what happened here is this, and I can't explain it simply. But for you life cycle analysis, you'll love this. What matters a lot here is your understanding of what happens to the land in the so-called counterfactual situation. In short, I think it's reasonable to assume that if we're in a world where we care so much about climate change, 
and land use impact, that we're promoting things like ethanol from grass, then we're in a world in which we want to do the best things that we can with land with respect to climate anyway. That's the exogenously defined world. That's the counterfactual. What that means is the proper comparison is with an alternative use of the land that maximizes climate change and biodiversity benefits. So what I've done here is I've assumed that any land that you take for grass or wood, whether it was a pristine prairie or some so-called degraded land, actually could be rehabilitated or allowed to regrow or restored to some more climate beneficial use. And that makes all the difference in the world. So for people interested in the methodology, it's questions like that that matter just as much as the technical details of what is the energy input out efficiency of a wood to ethanol conversion plant. That question matters enormously. What is the counterfactual? So one more to go, and I'm just going to skip ahead. So I have another model that estimates uh, in details the manufacturing cost, operating cost, energy use, and external costs of different types of vehicles. It's fairly detailed, and I'm going to use this to come up with an estimate of the total social cost of different vehicle types. And in that one, I will compare battery electric hydrogen fuel cell and a bioenergy vehicle. So it's a, now I'm going back to putting dollar values on several of those impacts that we talked about earlier, air pollution, noise, energy use, and climate change. But climate change now is going to get a boost. It's going to get a boost via the social cost of carbon. Remember when I showed you the 1990 study, what was it, one to $10 per metric ton CO2. Right now, the so-called interagency working group on climate change recommends a central value of 31 at a 3% discount rate and something else for the year 2010. Everyone knows that number is too low. We're not going to find out how much too low if Trump has his way. But I'm serious about that, by the way. Here is evidence that that number is way too low. What I've compiled there, and it's really just to show it's a credible analysis. I don't expect you to read it and understand it. But these are a bunch of recent studies that look at some key factors that drive estimates of the social cost of carbon. What is the social cost of carbon? It's an estimate of the value of the damages, malaria-induced deaths, heat stress-induced deaths, agricultural lost output, loss of tourism, rise in sea level, the value of those things in dollars per unit of carbon or carbon equivalent emitted under some scenario about climate change and a bunch of other scenarios, of course. That's what the social cost of carbon is. And how do you get these numbers, which I'll show eventually, which is the total value? Well, you multiply that life cycle CO2 equivalent number, right? That's emissions of carbon equivalents by the social cost of carbon number. Oh, I'm doing great then. I just got bought my filter. <laughs> so we need to have a good sense. What is the social cost of carbon number? Is it 10 from 1990? Is it 31 from the interagency working group? No, it's not. It's much higher, 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 higher. How much higher? Well, there's a bunch of things that typically haven't been included and, in fact, weren't included in their interagency working group's runs of some of these very same models that came up with the $31 number. And if you include some of those, wow, what do you get up here? Look at some of these numbers. Do you see the top row there? You can read that, right? There's not an extra zero put in there. And this really matters. I can't be explicit enough about this. $1,000 plus, wow, what's driving that? Well. The discount rate is driving it, how you value poor people dying compared to rich people dying, whether you have feedback effects of climate on economic productivity, whether you have risk aversion. These aren't little parameters, they're big parameters because a number can go from one to a hundred. Look at that, isn't that crazy? 
one. This is one model. That's the DICE model, famous model, simple model, but it's used. The mid case is 145. And this is kind of nuts, right? 0.5, 180. Wow. This is all over the place. We're spanning orders of magnitude here. So I looked at that, and knowing a bit about how these studies are, I don't have my own social cost of carbon model yet. We're going to work on one. But I decided that, especially based on a paper that said, numbers below 100 aren't reasonable. So I decided that's a lower bound. I think I went 100, 250, 600, and then made some changes after that. But I need to be clear. You can already tell. That's a really big difference from the 31 that most people assume. I mean, it's a really big difference. It's going to change the game here. All right, so this will be probably where I'll end. So kind of back to where I started with external cost analysis. It's a way of comparing the dollar value all in the same units of some of the impacts. Not all of them. I don't have water stress in here. I don't have biodiversity in here. But I got some big ones in here. And this is what we have here. So gasoline vehicle, an ethanol vehicle using switchgrass. This is a battery-powered electric vehicle with a 120-mile range. That's a hybrid electric vehicle up there. And over here is a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle with a 300-mile range using hydrogen made by water electrolysis, where the electricity supply is, of course, wind, water, and solar power, which is why you get the zero external costs there. Got it? So those are the options there. Battery electric, wind, water, solar power, hydrogen electric, biomass from switchgrass with those assumptions earlier that I showed you from the life cycle analysis. Yes? Is the uh, proposal for the car always that? Exactly, yes. So what it, thank you. So I was getting there. This is the present value of all of the costs over the lifetime. So you take the battery replacement costs, if any. You take all of these operating costs, the stream of external costs, the stream being all the air pollution costs every year and all the climate change costs. You take their so-called present value, just a way of discounting them then adding them back up. So you come up with this equivalent. This is sort of the dollar present value equivalent. Not sort of. It is <laughs> the present value dollar equivalent of that whole stream of costs, everything associated with the vehicle, well, not including accidents and travel delay. But So here's the bottom line number right there. And here's a key number right here, climate change, right? This driving. These are enormous differences, right? So the gasoline vehicle, under the assumptions that I had, the key one being, and this is, these are mid-case values, I think. Uh, are they mid-case values? Yeah, they're mid-case values. That'd be like the $250, oh, almost my time. $20,000 equivalent climate change damages for what I think is a reasonable mid-case value of the social cost of carbon. Of course, if you're only now getting only a 46% reduction instead of a 50 or 100% reduction from biofuels, you're taking an $11,800 hit right there on climate change damages. But I hope I've been up front about the assumptions and the conceptual framework that lead to this. And then you've got zeros here, so that even if you have slightly higher costs before you consider the present value of the external cost, right? That's what this is here. So yeah, you're paying a little more for this electric vehicle. Seems about right, considering all the costs. And a bit more, again, for the fuel cell vehicle in terms of uh, uh, outlays by the consumer. These differences, $1,000, $2,000, are swamped. <laughs> by these differences. They're even, they can even comp be compensated just by the air quality benefits alone. And here I've taken, by the way, a US or European level vehicle, and it's in the future. So its emissions are fairly low. Still, you get some air pollution damages which go away. But they're not the big item in this particular case. If you did this for a truck using dirty diesel fuel in India in the year 2020, boy, these numbers would be 10, 15, 20 times higher. That's an important point, too. But here I'm isolating just this critical value of climate change and showing how it affects this comparison basically of biofuels and electricity. So this 
number here overwhelms the small differences up here, and you get at the end much lower numbers for this is $66,000 in present value of all the total costs compared to 83,000 and 79,000. So now we're getting a sense of what I think is best, right? That's light duty vehicles. I've sort of touched on in some cases other vehicles. I think for heavy trucks, you can make inferences from light from light duty vehicles using fuel cells. I haven't done that analysis yet, but I'm reasonably comfortable that again with climate change driving it, you're going to see something similar, meaning hydrogen fuel cell trucks will probably be a lower social, the lowest social cost alternative if you can't run them on batteries. So back to trains, it's flip, but it's reasonable. You can mostly electrify trains and again run them off of wind, water, and solar power. Ships, it says right there, uh, port electrification is already ongoing. That's a big portion of total energy use too not just the port side infrastructure, but also the, what's it called, hoteling, the fuel use, energy use by the ships while they're sitting in port. That matters. Airplanes are the biggest problem. So here's your chance for biofuels. One of my collaborators who works with me on wind, water, and solar stuff won't tolerate even biofuels from waste in airplanes, but I leave the door open for it. Why? Well, because you, you need to have a <clears throat> pretty good thrust to weight ratio to make airplanes work, and batteries are a bit too heavy to supply long haul. We are looking at, we, the industry is looking at batteries for short haul craft on the orders of a few hundred kilometers. For long haul, you need either liquid hydrogen, which is doable. It's technically feasible. Planes have been flown with liquid hydrogen as a fuel. But it's a pretty big infrastructure change or biofuels, I would say, from waste. Why from waste? Because your land use impacts, if it's a true waste by definition, is zero. So all of those land use issues are gone. Also, all the water use issues, at least those associated with the actual production of the bioenergy feedstock, which is where most of the water use occurs, those issues go away as well. So biofuels from waste, you're left with what? You're left with combustion-related air pollution emissions and a minor amount of combustion-related non-CO2 greenhouse gas effects as well. I think it's worth it to consider it, because <laughs> LH2 is a big deal. So that's my thought. The other mode the answer. I'm going to have to just quit is, uh, I think that pushing electrification with the primary energy system being wind, water, and solar power is the best answer. There's a lot of other slides here that explain both why I think it's feasible socially and demographically, because there's a lot of interesting stuff happening on the demand side. And I can also talk about, or I would also talk about if I had time, why I think it's feasible on the power generation side, because some of you might be having questions about, well, wait a minute, wind, water, and solar power for the entire energy economy? The answer is yes, I think it's feasible. There's some important things that aren't well known, but that's my answer. And let me see. I have these really cool closing slides, but they're not really. Um... So I just let you read that because I like this guy. In order to have a wind, water, and solar system, you have to change a lot of things. You have to change the infrastructure. You have to change the way we deliver energy. You have to change all of the associated refueling stuff with ports and ships and airplanes. It's a big project. You can't do it just by incrementalism. You can't just do market tinkering. You have to have some grand plan. You have to be willing to invest in social planning and infrastructure. And that isn't in fashion now. And that's <laughs> my take on it, which is we've done it in the past, and we can do it in the future. So thank you. True enough, we did use up all the time, but I can hang around and answer questions for anybody. Um, you have maybe one minute to answer your question, and then I, I know that Mark is happy to answer questions. Um, it's offline. Oh, go ahead.
here for a second. So, in, in the models that you do, is there any way to capture things like tipping point, like where things get pretty nonlinear kind of, kind of quickly in, in terms of extrapolating out into the future? I, I, I don't know what was behind the model when you, when you doing that. Was that not the so that's a good question. So, tipping points, as you said, are points, say, in the climate system, this is typically where it's used, where something happens rapidly, and it's major, and it's irreversible. It just simply, like the change in the thermohaline circulation system is a good example, things like this. And it's hard to know when they occur, and there can be a sort of enough inertia in the system that when you get close enough, you can't stop it, and then you're kind of done in a brand new regime. The answer is, as I said, I don't do yet this social cost of carbon damage modeling. The people who have done these, like the fund model and the dice model and the page model, they don't have tipping points in them yet. Uh, I, that's an interesting question as to how you would actually represent that. So the answer is they're not there. There are people that do risk aversion parameters. And so they've sort of qualitatively, in a sense, or, or I guess in a general sense, accounted for it by saying, we're going to assume that as the temperature, the mean temperature increase gets greater, that the chance of some extreme event, irreversible event, increases. And we're really, really averse to that happening. So we're going to assign pretty big disvalue to temperature increases within a certain range, in part because of this phenomenon. So if you have some risk aversion parameter, which basically multiplies or scales up the damages exponentially, as an overlay on your other damage cost estimates. It, it is motivated in part by that. But I don't think there's anybody that does sort of formal modeling of when this happens and what, is, what the actual follow-on impacts are of change in circulation and what the damages are. What? It's OK if I say one. OK. <laughs> Right. I think that that means that it could be scalable. So federal, the federal government and state governments in, in California together offer the ten k. Correct. Well, good enough by what metric? I mean, what would be good enough? I mean, it has net it has net benefits. So, just by the normal standard. I would say it would be nicer to have even more benefits. Or to put it differently, it would be really nice if the consumer cost, private cost, whatever you want to call it, the actual cost of the vehicle and everything, not including the external cost, if that was for the battery electric vehicle even lower than for the gasoline vehicle so that you don't even have to put on the external cost in order to get this favorable cost benefit result, that would be nice. And if we can find an alternative that does that, that also produces the same consumer side benefits with respect to mobility and several other things we care about, mostly mobility and accessibility, that would be great. 
uh, if you're, and yes, we could expand the social cost benefit analysis, and people do that, and I've done something like it long ago to include transit systems. And uh, if you're saying, would it be useful to look more? Absolutely. And can we be more aggressive in the range of solutions that we think about other than, other than just substituting an electric drivetrain for an internal combustion engine drivetrain? Absolutely we should. For me, I think it's powerful enough to note that those are unsubsidized costs, that the private costs are pretty close, and then you get pretty big environmental benefits. And also, more importantly, that relative to bioenergy, if my assumptions are reasonable, if you buy my conceptual reasoning about it, that it's a, it's a preferred solution. So I don't know if that's an adequate answer. Maybe I'm not quite sure exactly what you're asking, but the answer is 17,000 of benefits is 17,000 of net benefits. And so that you know, makes you go, yeah, it passes the test. But we can look for more, yeah. Correct. Yes, and we've looked at that, and when I can look at that in this, I could, I can switch the electricity source here. I could give you an answer in, you know, two minutes if you wanted to see what but this is going to be. But yes. Well, that's true. That the electric vehicle is, is powered by electricity. It's made by wind. Uh, yes, and that's, that's critical. And that's not the case currently. That's right. It's not the case currently. And that's why it's important, and I tried to emphasize, and I hope it came through, that you have to have a clean primary energy system, that this is indeed a very important point. And then there's a whole set of other questions about the reliability and the optimal way to design and operate an all renewable variable generation system, which are several other seminars what worth. What do you think off the top of your head the benefit would be for the current fleet of electric vehicles powered by the current fleet power station? You mean, well, there's lots been several studies of that and it depends on what electricity mix do you assume? Are you talking about the current national average Based mix? California, and then I think we have to oh, there was one more. Okay. Um, oh, uh, California would be would California. would be po would probably be positive because it's heavy on. There's there's relatively little coal coming in. I think we still get some from Four Corners in L.A. and and you have to do. Ideally, you do a so-called marginal analysis or a dispatch analysis. Depends on the level of demand and when the electric vehicles recharge. There's lots of analysis. I'm sort of working on some of these projects right now peripherally about I exactly when you schedule the recharging and what plants are dispatched when and how you prioritize it. You've got excess solar in California in the summer months under some conditions. So, But, okay, that's a lot of mumbo jumbo about technical yeah, details. I think it all adds up to probably a benefit compared to gasoline vehicles. I'm fairly sure it does for California. For Calif oh, in round numbers? God, I don't know. Uh, 10,000 reduction. or So the 19,000, almost 20, was the damages from gasoline. Oh, I would guess, I'm going to guess at least half. I'm going to guess it would be a reduction of six, um, it, at least. I would guess two-thirds. That's just a number but off the top of my head. And nationally, it's not nearly as good unless you find some way to get coal analytically out of your <laughs> marginal power mix, in which case. But that's not really reasonable for the whole national system. But that's right. A big point is you got to electrify the transportation sector and simultaneously clean up the power system. And those two are integrated. That's another really interesting talk. There's a very important interaction between transportation energy demand and the optimal configuration and operation of the electricity system, too. A lot of research on that. And that's, so they're not independent problems at all. So we had one more there. I'm going to. Oh, you. Okay. Well, thank you again. So I'll be here for a little while. So. Thank you.